We're back here. Hope you had a good break. But let's uh, continue. Let's get back into Acts chapter 1. We read through the first eight verses. Let's go to page number 13 in our notebooks and we're going to pick up our reading at verse number 9 there with me. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Again, we're looking at first century Christianity. We're taking a very close look at what they did, what was important to them, what their priorities were, what their strategies, methodologies, all of those things. What kind of people were they? What, what kind of character did these people have? So we just uh, kind of gave you an introduction and in what a disciple is and some of the characteristics and marks of the disciple. We've read a little bit further. We really haven't commented on the text as of yet, but we will here uh, in this uh, next session, the one that we're uh, enjoying at the moment. Notice at the bottom of page number 13, in Acts 1.8, we read the last recorded words of our Lord Jesus Christ while he was still on earth. The baton is passed from Christ to his disciples in verses 8 through 11. So the Gospels record the life of Christ, the character of Christ, uh, the theology or Christology of Christ. And now we're in transition. We've gone from the Old Testament, the book of Matthew was transitional and brought us into the New Testament. And now we're going up from, and when I say into the New Testament, the New Testament really began at the crucifixion of Christ. So we're seeing the life of Christ uh, culminating in his crucifixion. And now we're in transition into what we would call today the church age. So at the bottom of page 13, notice there are some of these transitions that are mentioned there. We're going from the Gospels, the four Gospels. The book of Acts transitions us into the epistles. The following book is the book of Romans. We're going from a, an emphasis on Judaism to biblical Christianity, where there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is, is, is the same Lord over all and rich unto all that call upon him. We're going from the kingdom. Remember Acts chapter 1, verse number 6. You're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. We're moving from kingdom to church. We're moving geographically from Jerusalem. Ultimately, by the end of the book of uh, Acts, we're in Rome. That's where Paul is found. Of course, on the way, we find ourselves in chapter 13 in Antioch. And we're moving from the Old Testament law to a period of time that we understand as the age of grace. Again, a reminder at the top of page number 14, 35 years of Christianity is uh, documented here in the book of Acts. The general outline of the book takes us the first eight chapters, or the majority of those eight chapters, to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. I mentioned the book doesn't come to a natural ending. We're living in what some might call Acts 29 today. Uh, there's a list of purposes there, the emboldened print. What are some of the reasons? What are some of the things that are accomplished in, in the book? It provides the church with a record of its beginnings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can read through that. I don't need to elaborate at all. Who wrote this uh, particular book? It's always important to know who the author of the book is, although we believe that 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God, we believe that there were a human being was used, human instrumentality was used in the transference of God's word uh, onto a written page, spoken and then a written page, and ultimately we have a copy of that right now, the book of Acts, a copy of that found in the Bible. So there's some things said about Luke. Some people look at the book of Acts as uh, Acts volume 2 because obviously Luke was the author of the gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke was, a, his, was a, a great historian. He was a medical doctor. Some people are not sure whether he was a Jew or a Gentile. Again, that really doesn't make a lot of difference knowing that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. <clears throat> but we know he was a phys- <clears throat> excuse me, a physician from Colossians chapter number four tells us that. Um, he actually makes reference to some 80 geographical locations and mentions over 100 different people by name in his book. Very careful to record facts. Very careful to do that, which <clears throat> at this point in time are very helpful because it establishes the validity and the authenticity of the book of Acts. It's not just a lot of stories without specifics that are given here. It's not a bunch of fairy tales, so to speak. Uh, Luke documents what he says by this is where it happened, this is uh, when it happened, these were the people who were involved in that. And as we look back in time and we study archaeology and whatnot, the names and places that Luke has recorded in his gospel and also in the book of Acts lend credence to the fact that indeed what he is saying is true. They're documented, historical, documented, geographical facts. So it's very important to the validity and the acceptance of the New Testament as a credible historical book, not just a theological book, but a historical book. He wrote the book most likely prior to Paul's death and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now that date is important. I will not go into detail right now, but it probably will show up at some later date. <clears throat> Acts emphasizes several things, a list at the top of page 15, and F.F. Uh, F. Bruce says, the extension of the good news in the power of the Spirit is the theme of the book of Acts. What follows under that is an outline by uh, John MacArthur, I reference him in my own syllabus for this book. He has a two-volume commentary on the book of Acts, which I have read some years ago, which I think is very, very good. Um, and he outlines the book of Acts this way, the way we have outlined it earlier. Three major parts, that is the gospel to Jerusalem, and then Judea and Samaria, in the uh, passages that are listed there. And then in chapter number 13, Paul and Barnabas take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. I like to outline. I like to outline. I, outlining helps me get my brain around what I'm talking about. Outlining helps me understand the context in which the text is found, and it shows me the flow of thought through the text, through the chapter, through the book, through the passage, whatever it may be. It may be just a paragraph out of a chapter, but it helps me understand what I'm reading and give, gives me the context of it. By stopping and asking myself some of these uh, important questions about, uh, you know, who, what, when, where, why, how. I think those are all important questions when you're reading the scripture and getting the answers to them. It really helps you get established and understand what's going on in this particular chapter. So I like outlining, I like reviewing, I like establishing context for people. I find that many people read the Bible and have very little understanding of the context. Uh, we uh, teach here at First Bible what we call a big picture Bible study. 
The purpose for the Big Picture Bible Study is to establish biblical context. We take the Bible, we establish the chronology of the Bible, the main characters of the Bible, the storyline of the Bible. We do that in the big picture. What we're doing in the book of Acts is kind of a Acts big picture, if I can say that. We're trying to establish, particularly back in the first six pages of your outline, this is the big picture of what's going on in the book of Acts. And then we can break it down into smaller pieces to understand it. Um, I uh, highly recommend that when you read your, read your Bible, that you do your own outlining, that you ask yourself, yourselves the questions. Who is speaking? To whom is he speaking? What is he saying? Where did this take place? What time is this? How did it happen? Things like that. Those are the questions that help us really understand Scripture. Now, some people have a good uh, handle on original languages and vocabulary and things like that. I believe that to be a help in understanding Scripture. But I do not believe that you have to be proficient in Hebrew and Greek to understand the Bible. And, I'm not, and in no way am I diminishing the value of those. Please mis don't misunderstand me. But I'm just saying this. The, the scriptures were not written uh, so that you had to understand Hebrew and Greek to get the material or get the content uh, out of scripture. There are, someone said, about 11 thousand languages and dialects in the world today if you had to understand greek and hebrew and only those two languages to really understand the bible there'd be a lot of people that would be left out and i don't believe the intent of of uh, sharing god's word inspiring god's word and putting it in a vernacular putting it where the common man can get it that, that was god's intention again in no way do I diminish those who have uh, taken the time to learn those languages, to master those languages, but at the same time, I do not feel like I'm missing anything by not totally and completely understanding Hebrew or Greek or Latin or Syriac or the Peshitta or anything along those lines. So anyway, here's MacArthur's outline. And then uh, now we're going to start from this point on we begin a study of verse-by-verse verse, uh, statements. And so you can see, I didn't do this in my first message, my first lesson, because that was introductory. But from this point on, you'll see that I take verses out, phrases out, and I try to bring some understanding to each of those uh, phrases or those passages to help people uh, understand what's going on. So... Now, I don't do an exhaustive job on that. You can get some study Bibles um, that are excellent, that they footnote about every third word in every verse, and they give you some kind of background or definition, or they put the, that statement in a list. There's some great study Bibles like that that are helpful. My intent in 28 hours or so of teaching is to give people like an hour per chapter on the average, a general understanding of the book of Acts and what it's all about. Most people that will go through a study like this are ahead of 98% of Christians. Most Christians do not take the time to go through this kind of a study uh, in the book of Acts or any book of the Bible. But those of you that are doing this, by the time you're done, you'll have a pretty good handle on this uh, one book out of the 66 in the Word of God. So again, let's do this. Let's, uh, I'm going to pick out these phrases. I'm on page number 16. Uh, uh, notice the name Theophilus. Some people are not even sure that Theophilus was a real individual. That it's kind of, not a pen name, but it's, a, it's an imaginary person to whom Luke is writing. I don't subscribe to that, but there are those that do. His name has meaning, again, theos in Greek means God, phileo means to love, so Theophilus means a lover of God or dear to God or loved by God, 
all of those things probably uh, ha uh, have some reference or some meaning to the individual to whom Luke is writing. It says that Christ, in verse 3, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. There are at least 12 recorded appearances, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ recorded in Scripture. The resurrection, I believe, is the most important New Testament doctrine. For if Christ is not risen, we of all people are most miserable, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But it is the proof that Christ is who he said he was. He has the power of life and over life. In fact, it's the resurrection, I believe, that motivated the disciples. They were not really excited at the crucifixion. They weren't rejoicing, saying, ah, Jesus is dying on the cross and he's paying for our sins. No. Uh, they exited. They got out. They thought the movement had come to an end and that Jesus had been defeated. It was the resurrection of Christ after their defeat, after being uh, depressed and wondering what these last three years of life were all about. And when they had face-to-face -face confrontations with the post-crucified, post-risen Christ, that is what motivated them to do what we read in the book of Acts. In fact, it is truly the greatest proof that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was. It is the greatest proof that Christianity is the truth and that we need to live according to biblical and Christian principles in the word of God by many infallible proofs. Notice in verse number four, the term or the words together in one accord. If we want to learn things from the early church, we know that they were together, that they were united. And that's important for us in our churches today to be together, to be united, to work together, not to be divided with one another. Unity is very, very important. Notice the statement in verse 5, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost isn't a special privilege for some believers. Any true believer has been baptized by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. How do we know that? We can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. For by one Spirit, you're all baptized into one body. Entrance into the body of Christ, or the church as we understand it, comes as a result of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Any true believer is baptized with the Holy Ghost. The filling of the Holy Ghost isn't necessarily the same thing. Sometimes people are filled and baptized at the same time. You see that in the book of Acts. But don't be confused that that's always the way it is. You can be a, good, you can be a Christian in the body of Christ and not be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You can still be full of yourself and not full of God. He must, Jesus must increase, and you must decrease. All right. Looking on page number uh, 17, there's a great statement in verse 6. The disciples asked Jesus, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, Jesus doesn't say, that's a stupid and dumb question. He doesn't say that. That isn't his response. His response is found in verse 7 when he says, it's not for you to know the times which the Father hath put in his own power. In fact, the implication of that statement is, you know, I'm just not, I can't tell you right now. He's not saying it's not going to happen. He's just saying that is unimportant at to you at this particular moment. It's a valid question, but I don't need to answer that question right now. Now, this is an important point because there's really two kind of main strands of biblical Christianity today. There are those who uh, accept what we might call covenant theology. There are those who accept and live by what we would call dispensational theology. 
I am personally a dispensationalist. Now, what distinguishes a dispensationalist from a covenant theologian? One thing is this. It has to do with your opinion of the future of the nation of Israel. I believe that the kingdom that was promised to um, David, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel, the kingdom of which the disciples are asking about here, that that kingdom is yet future and it will come to pass, it will come to fruition in what we call the millennial reign of Christ, a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth, Revelation chapter number 20. So I believe that Israel has a future and there's many passages uh, in the Old Testament that would lead me to believe that. The covenant theologian, on the other hand, believes this, that the church now has become the new Israel. Because Israel rejected their Messiah, crucified Christ, they, ha they no longer have a claim on the promises of the Old Testament kingdom to them. That the New Testament church now is the kingdom. And we have now assumed all of the promises that were made to Israel in the Old Testament. We as the church are now celebrating that we are the possessors of those promises. That Israel has no future. Israel will not have a literal reign, a literal millennial reign of Christ. Consequently, their theology is termed a millennial, no millennium. So the difference between dispensationalists, general, these are general differences, and a covenant theologian is the covenant theologian believes that Israel is done and they do not believe in a millennial reign of Christ or literal thousand years, whereas a dispensationalist believes there's a future for Israel that God will fulfill his promises that he will restore his kingdom to Israel and there will be a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ as it has been prophesied in Revelation chapter number 20. And I believe six times in about seven verses that 1,000 years is mentioned. I believe it's literal. I don't believe it's figurative. So I think the question uh, is a, a great question there, and Jesus doesn't necessarily answer it. But in the meantime, in verse number eight, we read this. I'm not answering your question directly right now. It's not a stupid question, but it's not a priority. He says in verse number eight, ye shall be witnesses. Witnesses unto me. Wit Jesus' witnesses, if you please. Not Jehovah's witnesses, but Jesus' witnesses. I'm a Jesus witness. Um, oftentimes, uh, over the years, I've been approached by Jehovah, Jehovah's witnesses, and it doesn't take uh, much to figure out who they are. Just their whole approach is pretty uh, stereotypical when they begin to talk to you and uh, the questions that they ask you. And uh, I will say, oh, you're a Jehovah Witness, aren't you? And they'll go, well, and, and it's almost like they've been found out, you know. They don't say, yes, I'm glad you know that. They don't respond that way. They respond somewhat sheepishly like they've been discovered or they've been found out so I say oh you're a Jehovah Witness aren't you oh well uh, uh, yes we're, we're uh, and I would then respond to that and say well I'm a Jesus witness I'm not a Jehovah Witness Jehovah is a word that's used oftentimes in the Old Testament for God but Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when he was commissioning his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel, he said, you will be witnesses unto me. I'm a Jesus witness. Did you hear that silence? That's the silence I get from them. They don't know what to say to that. The issue with a Jehovah Witness is always Jesus. That's the issue. You can argue about different things about the kingdom. You can argue about the 144,000. You can uh, talk about soul sleep and, you know, annihilation. And there's lots of things that you can talk about with a Jehovah Witness. But don't get distracted. 
the one thing, the main issue is who is Jesus Christ? And what is your relationship to him primarily? No man comes unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. That's the most important thing is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice in verse number 9, he was taken up out of their sight. He was taken up. This is what we call the ascension of Jesus Christ. Notice at the top of page number 18, the duty of evangelizing the lost world, this is a quotation from uh, John MacArthur, is a daunting one. But the Lord in his mercy from the start has provided all the spiritual resources necessary to accomplish the task. It's up to each believer to appropriate these resources and put them to use. It's an, indiv it's an individual thing. You all have a free will. Each one of you have priorities in your own life. Each one of you, I assume, has a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are responsible for your response. That's what responsibility is. Being responsible for your response. When we read all of this, we can intellectually process it, and we have to do that. That's part of it. But it needs to go past the brain and strike us deep down in our heart. The duty of evangelizing lost world is each and every one of our responsibilities. The importance of all this is in the fact that they saw, that is, the disciples saw Jesus, they saw him after his crucifixion and resurrection. And that is what inspired them to the great work that's accomplished in these first 35 years of the church. Well, we know Christ was ascended into heaven. Verse 11 says there's two men there. Presumably, presumably these two men are angels. Uh, uh, I believe that. And uh, we've given you some more information on that. Now, meanwhile, the upper room. Uh, verse number 12 of chapter 1. It could be, uh, some believe, it could be the same upper room where they celebrated the Last Supper. That wouldn't be unreasonable. I don't, I, I'm assuming that, but I, don't, I can't point to a biblical statement that would make that a fact. Notice in verse number 12 the phrase, Sabbath day's journey. What is a Sabbath day journey? Well, the distance is derived, according to tradition, from Israel's encampments during the wilderness wandering. The furthest tents were about 2,000 cubits, a half to three quarters of a mile, from the tabernacle. Since work was prohibited on the Sabbath in Exodus 20, the maximum walk would be to the tabernacle, a half a mile to three quarters of a mile. Hence, when we talk about a Sabbath day journey, it's a pretty short walk, something that you could walk in probably uh, 10, 12 minutes if you're a slow walker, really. I mean, you should be able to walk about, if you've you got a pretty good pace, you can walk a mile in about 15 minutes approximately. Verse 14 says, these all continued. Again, we pointed this out before with one accord. Much is said in this verse. We've got the apostles minus Judas. All, there's unity, togetherness. They continued, they're constant. Again, unity. Uh, they were in prayer and supplication. 20 plus references in the book of Acts to this. They were with the women, first, who were, which by the way were the first to experience, see the resurrected Christ, as we read in Matthew 28. Uh, Mary was there, the mother of Christ, and his brethren. The number we know, Jesus had 12 apostles minus uh, Judas, but the number grew from this group of people to about 120, verse number 15, and we know that the book of Acts records great evangelistic results where thousands of people were won to Christ uh, in this early church. So how can we personally apply what we are reading thus far in this chapter? What can we do? 
What kind of people were these? Again, we're studying New Testament Christianity. What were these people like in the New Testament church? What were they like? They were obedient people. They were actively waiting. They weren't waiting because they were lazy. They were told to wait for the promise of the Father which came. They were praying together. They were constant. They were growing. They were motivated, I might add. And uh, they were very diverse, a diverse group of people, particularly seen when we get into Acts chapter 6 and 7, we see a list of uh, these deacons in this church. We see quite a variety of individuals there. So it was, uh, although it's to the Jew first, the gospel, and also to the Greek, there were many others, proselytes, if you please, Gentiles, who were being influenced and brought into the fold in the early church. It was a close-knit community of like-minded believers infected by authentic spirituality, which is contagious. Excited people, motivated people, spiritual people attract excited people, motivate people, and, and uh, uh, sometimes experienced people along these lines. People attract people. People can have a, a very powerful impact on others. When you are positive in your role in your church as a church member, you positively impact other people. When you walk in church on Sunday morning, need I say, need I say, if you come in with a poochy lip, feeling sorry for yourself, looking like you feel sorry that you came to church, you will have a negative impact on other people. It behooves us to be the best we possibly can. I know sometimes, sometimes we have to play act, if I can use that term. We have to, even when we're sad, we have to put on, put on a good face. Uh, I'm not saying it's wrong to be sad, but what I'm saying is this. Don't drag other people down with you. Be positive. Be encouraging. Be the type of person that other people really like to be around and you pick them up to your level rather than dragging people down to your level. These were the witnesses. And the baton is passed here in chapter number one from the Lord Jesus Christ, passed on to these uh, disciples. So what are we talking about again, just by way of review, and we'll take a break here in just a moment. We're talking about people who were intentionally involved in spreading the gospel of Christ. They were involved because they personally knew the Savior. They had a relationship with him. And they had witnessed a resurrected Christ. They were not discouraged. They were not despondent. They weren't ready to throw in the towel. Now they weren't. They were, just a short time ago, probably, things weren't looking real good for them at the crucifixion. However, three days later, things changed radically. Everything changed radically when Christ came out of the grave. And for you and for me, that's who we serve today. We serve a risen Christ. We serve a Christ who came out of that grave. We serve a risen Christ who lives forevermore. And he said to his disciples, and he says, in effect to you and I, and ye shall be witnesses unto me to be the kind of disciples that Christ, that Christ had in mind and directed his disciples to be and wants us to be. We need to study closely these first few chapters, these early days of the church, and see what kind of character these people had and what their priorities were really all about. So we're going to take a break now, right now. Uh, questions and answers. Uh, take a, get something to drink, whatever, maybe a brief discussion here, 
and we'll be back in just a few moments.